a young man walks into a police station. He wants to confess to two brutal murders. <laughs> Down like that. Really. How many times do you think you hit him? 40 plus times. While his story would be like nothing police had ever heard before. And I got a sharp knife and cut his head off. A pentagram was on this side. Yeah, I used his hand. I just the sequel to his tale would hold a bizarre twist. Max was up in there. One that script writers could never have imagined. I thought, here we go again. We've got a serial killer with the manual. And it mentions who's going to be my next victim. I thought, that's it. I'm dead. <laughs> When two murders occurred within two weeks of each other, police knew there was one offender. The killer now had voluntarily walked into this police station and confessed. But his admission would not signal the end. Another man would die, and a family would be left to pick up the pieces. Well, I do agree that about 8.55pm uh, last evening, uh, you attended the Wollongong police station with a man named Rodney Day. Yes. And do you agree when you went to the front counter you spoke to some police there? Yes. And do you agree that you told them that you were responsible for the death of Mr O'Hearn? Yes. Four months earlier, 60-year-old shopkeeper David O'Hearn was found murdered. And Mark Van Crevel was unknown. It was a scene that I'd never encountered in all my years in the police. There was a body of a male. He'd been decapitated, and it appeared that he'd been completely disemboweled. On one of the walls, there was a pentagram with the word Satan beside it. Another wall had an inverted cross. All these drawings uh, appeared to have been drawn in the victim's blood. Located near to where the body was found was a crystal decanter, which was used to commit the offence of murder. While the fingerprint found on the stopper of the decanter matched none on police files, the satanic drawings led detectives to 19-year-old Keith Schreiber. Keith wasn't at home, but they were invited to inspect Keith's room. Tony, come and have a look at these. In his bedroom, they found a number of drawings that depicted uh, headless bodies and uh, disembowelment. Keith was found at his workplace. And of all things, he was a filleter. Where were you last Friday? He gave us the alibi that he was staying with his employer for the evening. Uh, we confirmed that alibi with his employer. Then, only two weeks after the first murder, another man was killed, with chilling similarities. We're starting to look as if we might have a serial killer running around. <laughs> Former MP and alleged pedophile Frank Arkell murdered in his Wollongong home. Like David O'Hearn, Frank Arkell was in his 60s. Both men were homosexual and both had been mutilated post-mortem. I noted it was an unusual and uh, very sadistic characteristic that three tie pins had been inserted into his face. Investigators found fingerprints on the box containing the tie pins but the fingerprints weren't on record, which is a bit scary when you think about it. Um, a person who had no criminal record all of a sudden leaping into murder. It's very, very strange. The only lead police had to the killer's identity were the clothes he'd left at Frank Arkell's flat. These are the clothes worn by Frank Arkell's killer. A pair of blood-spattered tracksuit pants, socks and hiking boots found discarded in the granny flat where Mr Arkell was murdered. We're obviously anxious to speak to anyone that's recognised these items of clothing or in fact seen anybody wearing those clothes in the area. One girl rang up and, uh, and said that a former boyfriend of hers had owned boots and tracksuit pants and they vanished, for want of a better word, shortly after the death of Frank Arkell. So you're starting to look at something that's a, a very promising lead. The woman had given us the name of her ex-boyfriend as being Mark Van Crevel. Police immediately put him under surveillance. 
And as a result of seeing him with Keith Schreiber, they realised they'd met their suspect before. Mark Van Crevel had actually been interviewed some three days after the murder of David O'Hearn. He had been the flatmate of Keith Schreiber. I told you that I He just flew right under the radar. He was interviewed as an alibi for Keith Schreiber. The statement he signed was examined and fingerprints developed. A match was made to the stopper found at the O'Hearn crime scene. It suggested that we were looking at the right offender. But they needed to prove it. During the surveillance operation, an opportunity arose to seize a discarded Coke bottle. Fingerprints on that bottle were then compared. The fingerprints found on the Coke bottle were the same that were found on the record of interview, were the same that were found at the crime scene. They were those of Mark Van Cripple. With that confirmation, the team prepared for the arrest, but Mark Van Crevel had different plans. He came in and said, oh, I want to tell you something, but if I tell you, will it mean I'll be expelled or removed from training? I said, oh, well, Mark, you know, things aren't ever that grim. He kind of uh, um, I just, wanted to ask just shook his head and said, you know those murders in the paper? Um, yeah, well, I did them. We finally got to the police station and I said I needed to speak to someone in charge and she said what was it concerning and I said oh well the young man with me his name's Mark and he submitted to two murders. And then it finally all hit home and it was like wow this guy has really done this and uh, I kind of thought well, how lucky am I to even get him here. I suppose in your own words can you tell me what information you have about the death of Mr O'Hearn? Simply to speak up and just tell me what you what you know about it. I don't know anything much about David himself, but um, oh, I murdered him. It was about 9:30 p.m. and I got a call from one of my team to say that uh, a man had walked into Wollongong Police Station to confess to the the murders of Frank Arkell and David O'Hearn. For the purpose of the interview, can you give me your full name? Mark. Marla Valera. Two weeks before walking into the police station, Mark Van Crevel had changed his name via deed poll to Valera. I suppose in your own words, can you tell me what information you have about the death of Mr O'Hearn? I don't know anything much about David himself, but... Um, oh, I murdered him. That's, I, don't know, I don't know much about him. I didn't know him as a person. Well, can you tell me, say, your movements for that day? And we're looking for uh, the 12th of June, 1998, when David was killed. I uh, went to David O'Hearn's house at about 6 o'clock at night. It was it an arrangement that you had to go there at that time? Um, no, no. Or did you just simply just turn up out of the blue to go and see him? Yeah. Did David know you were coming there? No. no. Do you know David O'Hearn? No. I just um, went to his house. I knew where he lived. Or how did you know where he lived? No, oh, I've seen him around because I lived in the same street. Well, why did you go to his house? Just, um, I had in my mind that I wanted to kill someone that day. I was really angry and I said to myself, I could kill someone. David O'Hearn's murder was simply just a random attack. He wanted to know what it was like to kill somebody. Simple as that. Very cold and very shocking. I'll just get you to turn around, Mark, and just face the video if we can, thanks. Um, as we said in the interview, um, back at the police station in Wollongong, you came to the house that morning, oh, that after that night, about 6pm, yes. and you said you've knocked at the door, so the, the front door was closed. Now, can you indicate to me what happened once Mr O'Hearn answered the door and where you went to? Um. I stayed at the door and asked if there was any um, like accommodation around. And like he said, come in and we'll talk about it. And um, I talked about with him and he offered me a drink. As David O'Hearn's sister had told police when her brother was killed, David was extremely kind-hearted. He just trusted people. He, he liked people. And I think he, he, he liked to help people that 
he thought needed a hand. But that generosity led to his death. And if you can take the place of, of David O'Hearn for the purpose of this exercise, if I can just get you to stand up, please. And you, if you can indicate, if Detective Castor is walking away that way, if you can just indicate what you did with him. Yep. And walk, and bang, hit him on the head, and he slumped down there. And I continued to hit him on the head with the bottle, I think, about 10 times. Do you recall what that glass? Well, it was some fancy glass bottle, just like well rounded. And um, it was really heavy. And when you went to the house, did you carry anything with you? No. I strictly use all his stuff. Can you indicate whereabouts you found items in here? Found there was a hacksaw up here with a hammer, <coughs> and the knives were just in the drawers here. And I got a sharp knife and um, cut through his stomach. And. Like, cut through his stomach and I cut his head off. I cut his hand off. And I wrote all the signs on the wall. Do you recall where you drew the... Yeah, we'll start uh, with that first. The pentagram was on this side. OK. Yeah, I used hand. his hand. I just... Like, drew it? Drew that there, in the circle. There were certain things about the satanic messages that were left at the David O'Hearn crime scene that only he would have known about. Now, whilst we're aware that some of that information uh, was released in the media. There were specific things that were done in that scene that only he would know about because he was there. I went, when I do it next, I'd done the inverted cross on that side of the wall. I'm not satanic, but in satanic terms, it's like Jesus hanging upside down in hell. Well, where did you learn about these things? Oh, like um, from the music I used to listen to. Now, at that stage, what did you decide to do? I just um, looked at his body for, I don't know, just a couple of minutes, just looked at, um, seeing what I'd done. And then um, I just took the gloves off and I washed all the blood off my hands and off my face because there was a fair bit of blood on my face. And then I um, walked out, calmly walked out. It's like probably nothing I've ever seen before for a kid of his age to, to start to confess to these things and talk about how he did it with such, um, you know, just lack of remorse. Is there any reason why you did it? Why I killed David yeah. Owen? Mm, I was like, I don't know, not really, no. I mean, I was angry that day, but no particular reason, no. He wasn't confused. He was very sure of what he had to say to us, and the Frank Arkell in me was no different. Frank Arkell had been murdered only two weeks after David O'Hearn. OK, now, do you know, did you know Frank Arkell prior to this? I knew of him. Well, what did you know of him? I knew that he was a convicted pedophile. And what made you decide to go to his house that afternoon? I um, had in my mind that I wanted to kill him because I um, didn't like him. So. So I just pretended I was gay and like I called him up. Can you remember what you actually said? What, you, what name you gave? Uh, hi, uh, my name's John. Uh, John. I was wondering if I could come down to your house and he said, yeah, sure, you come down, blah, blah, blah. I walked down to his house and like he thought like I liked him. <laughs> and um, I went Go into ahead, his room out the back. He turned his back to me. I rammed him into the wall. And what's happened then? Once his head struck there, what's happened? He fell to the ground and I gave him a few hard boots. OK, all right, now. What I grab next? Um, fucking hell. Pardon my language. I grabbed the cord and I put it around his, around his neck. I was attached to a lamp. And I just like, thrust it down like that. Really. How many times do you think you hit him? 40 plus times. More than 40 times? One could picture, as he was confessing to it, uh, the the, uh, the hopelessness that Frank would have been going through. Here he is being beaten to death by this man. I had blood all over my face and on my hands, on my boots. I was swearing at myself. Got blood all over me, 
effing pants. Show me where, where you took the boots off. I took them off just at the end here. I just like went down and like undone my boots. And I just left them here. There's a reason why you left the boots here. Well, I didn't want to take them with me. Why is that? Well, isn't it obvious like someone would have seen me with bloody boots? As the media looked on from the street, Mark Valera was escorted from the granny flat to Frank's main house. I just walked through here and there's a couple of pairs of black, um, like track pants. There's the black one, what I got. Whereabouts were they when you found them? They were just like on the bed. My intention was to find something to wear other than bloody pants. And what have you done with the black pair of pants? I just um, carried them out. I just walked out. When I came back, I got the tie pins. I just looked around. OK, can you show us whereabouts you got the tie pins? you recall the tie pins? <sighs> they were up here. I was just looking for them. And I stuck some tie pins, one in his eye and one in his cheek, his left face cheek. OK. You've got different tracksuit pants off yeah. because you left your Nike ones here. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. What have you done then? I just stepped over the blood and I walked out and I can just leave the old bloody pants in there. What's made you want to come forward now? Uh, I feel it's um, the right thing to do and I had to get the shit off my chest. Well, can you give me a reason why you decided to kill Frank Arkell? Uh, I didn't like him. Uh, I know it wasn't for me to take it into my hands, but... Uh, I've, I felt someone should have killed him. Is it something that you plan to do? Mark Valera's confession to the murders of David O'Hearn and Frank Arkell was ongoing. I said to myself, I could kill someone. What made you angry? I don't know, some stress, I guess. What type of stress? Oh, I just um, stress out a lot. Um, to relieve the stress you were under, you went out and and did this. Yeah. Despite the fact that Mark was confessing to the crime, we had to make sure that we had other good evidence that placed him at the scenes of the crime in case his confession would not be accepted by the court. We arranged for our team to go back and conduct a number of search warrants on his father's house where Mark was known to stay and also on a hostel in Wollongong where we knew that he was staying at the time. This is the home of Jack Van Creevel. Mr Van Creevel has indicated that his son's room is down the hallway there and to the left, and that is where we're going to search. What we found there was items that linked him directly back to the crime scenes. Those items were the missing tracksuit top, the identical one that matched the tracksuit pants that we had found at the home of Frank Arkell. We also found the tracksuit pants that had belonged to Frank and that Mark had put on before he left Frank's house in order to get home. Pamela Young and her team then moved on to the hostel where Mark Valera had told police he was currently staying. We found a gold chain that we knew absolutely was the property of David O'Hearn. I believe a family member had given it to David and David was very fond of that. And when we found his body, he did not have that gold chain. So to find that type of evidence was critical. A number of items seized from the search warrants made the police brief all that much stronger. Of particular significance was the book, The A to Z of Serial Killers. Not only did this book relate to the serial killing, but also listed the two victims, David O'Hearn and Frank Arkell, and a number of other people who Mark thought about killing. Well, here we are, we've got a serial killer with the manual. On a number of pages that mentions who's going to be my next victim. I've got no doubt that he would have done it again. At the conclusions of the interview in relation to the Frank R. Kell and David O'Hearn murders, Detective Oxford and I spoke to Mark in relation to his knowledge of the Parkin murder. 
Trevor Parkin had been murdered in his Sydney flat some six months before the other two men. I'm thinking, if, if he hasn't done that one, who has? The, the injuries at one Trevor Parkin and, and David O'Hearn were so similar. Surely this man did three and not two. Whereabouts were you working in Sydney? Um, playing at Hollywood, you know, restaurant in George Street. So that's where you're washing dishes? <coughs> yeah. How did you travel up to Sydney? <coughs> Train every day. So at that stage you were living with father? Yeah. And you'd commute from there to Sydney to work at Planet Hollywood? Yeah. That workplace was significant. At the Parkin crime scene, they had found a box of matches from Planet Hollywood. And Mark being a previous employee was one link which suggested that this investigation may actually be linked between the other two investigations. But as it turned out, another young man admitted to this murder four months after Valera's confession. 20-year-old Christopher Robinson's fingerprints matched those found in Parkin's flat. Hi, Sensei, if you're watching. Mark Valera had now spent 23 months on remand, and his trial for the murders of David O'Hearn and Frank Arkell was underway. Mark Valera had confessed to killing both men. Yet at trial, he claimed it was manslaughter, not murder, on the grounds of provocation. Forensics would make a liar of him. Shortly before the trial was to start, we were told that uh, they were gonna uh, run a defense that he was abused, sexually abused by his father. Mark Valera said at trial that it was Mr. Ahern who had taken down his own trousers in the living room of his townhouse and invited him to take part in a sexual act, that this, uh, in effect, had him flashing back to similar acts in which he was invited to take part with his father. And it was then that he lost control of himself, took up the wine decanter and commenced hitting and ultimately killing Mr Ahern. Mark Valera's defence lawyer told the court both men were killed because they wanted sex with the accused. He also blamed Valera's interest in Satanism and 10-year history of physical and sexual abuse at the hands of his father. It was only when the power of Satan flowed through him or that he became Satan himself that Mark was so powerful he could kill the man he hated, his father. When I examined the trousers that were worn by David Alhearn, there was a number of areas of blood staining on the rear of the jeans. This blood staining extended down from the buttocks area, right down the upper portions of the legs of the jeans. So we're able to prove that the jeans would have been up and, and worn by Mr O'Hearn at the time that the blood had been placed on them. The forensic evidence was totally inconsistent with the version that Mark Valier was giving at trial that David O'Hearn had removed his own pants. As a brother, I just could not imagine Jack being physically abusive, like violently abusive, let alone sexually abusive. That is just impossible to think that could be true. Jack Van Crevel agreed with defence suggestions to him that he had been very, very hard on his son and that he certainly physically abused him. Uh, however, he at all times vehemently denied that, he, that that abuse had ever extended to a sexual abuse of his son. I believe that Jack owned up to physical abuse side of it to try and diminish Mark's responsibility for his actions. There was certainly evidence at the trial which was inconsistent with a father sexually brutalising his son. Jack used to overindulge with his kids. He was prompted by Mark that he wouldn't mind riding motocross. And so he bought them bikes each and the best of protective equipment and everything else. He bought a bike of his own so he could participate. Yeah, he, he was a good parent in that respect. The jury obviously agreed, rejecting Valera's plea of provocation and diminished responsibility. A 21-year-old man has, found, has been found guilty of murdering former state MP Frank R. Kell and Wollongong shopkeeper David O'Hearn. Mark Van Crevel said during the trial that both his victims wanted him to perform homosexual acts. He also accused his father of a lifelong pattern of violent physical and sexual abuse. After the verdict, Van Crevel's mother left the courtroom distraught. Father's fault! I'll get you, Jack! I'll get you! He drove him to do it. He drove him to do what he did. He's the one that should be in jail, not my brother. Less than two weeks later, Jack Van Crevel, 
Mark's father, was dead. He, like David O'Hearn and Frank Arkell, had been brutally murdered and mutilated. Mark Valera, formerly known as Mark Van Crevel, had claimed that he had been provoked into killing two men and that his father's sexual abuse of him was to blame. But the jury rejected his plea of manslaughter and found him guilty of the two murders. Two weeks later, his father was dead. When I recalled the Jack Van Crevel's house, I thought, here we go again. And it was just, I couldn't believe me, my, my ears because of what had happened over the, the previous two years. When we entered the main bedroom, I was able to see the, the body of the deceased, Jack Van Crevel. Jack was uh, kneeling beside the bed uh, with his chest lying on the bed. His arms were down beside his torso. He wasn't wearing any clothing at the time. He had sustained severe trauma to his back and his head. There was a large amount of blood all over the bed sheets and some cast off blood on the curtains and wall directly behind where Jack was lying. At the foot of the bed beside Jack's body, police located a hatchet, a knife and a fire poker lying side by side. We were unsure if the axe had actually been um, located at the premises, but the poker was one of a matching set of items that were located in the lounge room of the premises. And where the poker would have been located, there was a vacant spot in that area. And the knife um, was similar in appearance to a number of other knives that were located in the kitchen area of the premises. Given that, the, that, that at least two of the items had been gathered from different parts of the house, it showed that the offender had some time in the premises and, and wasn't too concerned about being located. He appeared to have been wandering around the house looking for items that he could have used. There were some bloodstained um, foot impressions or shoe impressions that were leading from the main bedroom out into the hallway. But then um, the blood had started to dilute and the, the shoe impressions were not so visible. We're able to um, see with the luminol that the shoe impressions actually led from the hallway. They led through the lounge room over to the area beside the fireplace where the poker would have been located. They then travelled back through the lounge room again, back into the hallway and back into the bedroom where the deceased was located. Other clear shoe impressions were found on the tiles in the hallway. Should police find a suspect, they would be able to match the tread to his shoes. Then as investigators moved down the hallway, there was further evidence of the killer's activities. And in this room, we found a bloodstained partial shoe impression on a small child's lounge, which was underneath the window. From the direction of the shoe impression, it appeared that the offender had been exiting the window when he'd placed the, um, the bloodied shoe impression on the lounge. Then there was a fly screen that was missing from that window. All the other windows in the house were fitted and secured with fly screens. So it appeared that, um, that the offender may have entered through that window. Jack's granddaughter was fortunately not in the room that night, but in the next room with her mother, Belinda Van Crevel, Mark Valera's sister. I was woken by the noises and I'm like, gun, shush, and was that frightened? And I put the quilt over me, head, and put, the, put it over her head, so it's like somewhere hidden. That went on for a while, I don't know exactly how long, like just all noises. And then um, my bedroom door opened and like that was it. I thought that's it, I'm dead. There was a number of small blood smears on the external door frame of the doorway leading to Belinda's bedroom, um, as well as a number of uh, small blood smears on the actual door handle. Um, and then it closed again and I just laid there, like, like scared, like, I went stiff. I was that worried that, like, someone was going to kill me. Come and do you too. Yeah. Then I didn't want to stay in the house either. When I got, was holding tail, when I walked out of my room, when I seen the blood, there was no way in the world I was going to open my dad's door. Um, like, I wanted to get out of there. So I just jumped in my car. When I jumped in my car, I felt a bit relieved and locked the doors and then drove straight to the real police station. How do you feel about what's all what's happened? I'm 
scared for my sake and for T's, like for T's sake. And like, I don't want to get Mark in trouble or anything like that. He's already in enough trouble. But I've always had my suspicions about those two killings. And now this happening, like, I just, it just everything isn't fitting together and, it, and I just, I don't know what to do. Who, who do you um, think is responsible for your father's death? I don't know. It was certainly a consideration that Mark Valera had organised the murder of his father. That was based on the fact that the book seized from Mark's possessions, the A to Z of serial killers, had a number of names identified in the book. Frank R. Kell, Dave O'Hearn and Who Will Be My Number Three. One of those names was Jack Van Krebel. I know that he despised his father and it was our thinking that perhaps his father would have been his third victim. Well, I went to the jail to interview Mark after his father's death to see what information he had. He just really had no remorse at all for his father and he, he just simply wanted to know more about what had happened and more the fact of, of, of having any sorrow at all. It was very chilling actually. Inquiries were conducted at the jail and on phone records uh, and it was soon identified that there weren't too many people that had visited Mark whilst in jail. One of those visitors was Keith Schreiber who Mark was living with when he murdered David O'Hearn. Keith Schreiber was Mark Valera's best friend. He grew up with Mark and he first came to my notice in the initial stages of the murder investigation surrounding David O'Hearn. And I'm aware through prior interviews with Jack Van Crevel that he didn't hold Keith in any high regard. In fact, he despised the fact that uh, Keith was spending so much time with his, his son as he saw him as a bad influence. inside jails or anything like that. I don't want to get Mark in trouble, but maybe he is covering for someone and they said that he, they'd do this for him, or, um, or maybe he's asked someone, I don't well, know, well, to right. do well, it. Having said that, then who would you think he would get to do it? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. If he hadn't have told, if he hadn't have said the things that he'd said to me about Keith, I'd say Keith, but apparently he's gutless. Jack Van Crevel, the father of double murderer Mark Valera, had been bashed to death. The main suspect was Mark's best mate, Keith Schreiber. There were only a number of suspects who may have committed the offence. Certainly, it may have been someone that wasn't related to the, this, this whole scenario. That was certainly another consideration. But Keith was our main suspect. The starting point was first trying to identify where he was. One of the last people to see Keith was Mark's sister, Belinda. On the day before Jack Van Crevel's murder, Belinda told police that she had met with Keith Schreiber to travel to the Civil Water Jail to visit her brother, Mark Valera. Uh, however, as Belinda had failed to make any prior appointment, these plans had fallen through. So Belinda had spent part of that day with Keith Schreiber. And where's Keith these days? He's homeless. He's homeless, is he? Yeah, that's what he said. Did he say where he was going? Oh, when we were sitting in the car when I first went there, he told me that he was staying under a bridge and he got a sheet of tin or something and put it up. So I suppose he was just sleeping. I don't know. He didn't tell me where he was going, but I assume he probably had nowhere to go. We received a phone call from a witness that identified Keith being down around the area of the Albion Park train station. Police were immediately deployed to the railway station to locate and arrest Keith. We were of the view that if Keith was in fact the murderer, that he would be armed with some sort of weapon. It was at that point that Keith was arrested and conveyed to the Port Kembla Police Station where he was entered into police custody. It was important that he was conveyed to the police station in order for us to interview him and capture any forensic evidence that he may have on him. At the time Keith had been placed into police custody, his shoes had been seized at the earliest opportunity. 
When I was examining the shoes that had been worn by Schreiber, I saw a large irregularity on the sole, which was an exact match to the irregularity that we'd located on the tile portion of the hallway at the premises at Albion Park. Electronically recorded interview between Detective Senior Constable John Northfield and Keith Andrew Schreiber. Okay, Keith. Well, is there anything you can tell us about the incident that occurred last night with Mr. Jack Van Crevel? I'm done it. Happy. Can you tell me why you did it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I was depressed and angry. He should, he should pay for what he'd done to, to Mark and Lena. During the interview, Keith's demeanour was very erratic. He was become emotional, he'd become agitated at points, and then he'd become solemn in his answers. It was all over the place. When this was happening, did you say anything to Jack? Yeah, sort of for revenge for Mark. I said, I told him when I turned the light on, I told him this is for Mark. Fuck, pedophile bastard. You'll never molest another kid again. Keith, if we can just get you to hood up, and uh, just for the purpose of the camera, yes, it's uh, it's just to cover your own identity, because as you're aware, there are a number of media cameras out the front, and we believe possibly out the back. Okay, yep. so, so you can just so we, okay, as long as you can see, we'll we'll guide you if you need a hand. Axel's up in there, indicating up. In the corner of the, the garage there is where the tomahawk was located, yes. Keith had spent quite an amount of time leading up to the murder at that house, so he would be aware that that, that would be the normal resting place for the axe. Got the bucket, and the window was open already, so I pushed it open. Yeah, pushed it open, um, stood on, and uh, climbed through. OK, we're now in the deceased Jack Van Crevel's bedroom. Can you tell me what happened when you came in here? Up here. He was there, snoring. And I kicked it like that. And that's what made the noise? Yeah. And he woke up. Whack. What were you feeling when you were doing this? It was loneliness. I was feeling lonely. You, you said earlier that you... you yeah, uh, fucking hatred and anger, fucking. But before, but when I was doing, so, yeah, loneliness as well. Felt fucking, yeah, sort of wanted him to get me first. Why were you hoping that? Just fucking hate my life. If you can call it life. He got up, uh, sort of sort of rolled over a bit, and I hit him again. What did you hear? <sighs> like that, but really loud, like, <sighs> like someone breathing really heavy, but like, like, <sighs> like that, but really loud. Like, I can't even describe what it was like. It was awful. So what's Jack doing while this is happening? Um, yeah, he's going, hey, 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 and I'm, uh, that, um, stabbed him more. And then I heard, Ah, ah, like that, but like louder. I turned the light on as I come back in. Um, and then that's when he seen me. Uh, it was, um, and then I hit him um, okay, a couple, few times with the stoker. When he saw you, what happened? He looked at me and goes, Kate. And then my gun, And why were you doing this? Why? Yes. To kill him. What did you do then? I ran out. Yeah. Balloon's door was closed. Um, I sort of pushed open there a bit. And then, no, uh, closed it. And after this, I went 
into the kitchen. It was in the walk around that Keith was asked to point out the location where he'd found the weapons used in the murder. Uh, at one point, we'd walked back into the kitchen and he was asked to point out where he'd found the knife. Whereabouts do you was the knife? Tell us exactly what you did. Yep. I can draw. Where did I get it from? There's another drawer there. Oh. It wasn't until he got to the kitchen area that he was somewhat confused as to where he located the knife. To me, that suggested that Keith didn't get the knife from that location and that he either retrieved the knife from another part of the house or it may have even been left for him. There's been a bizarre twist to a notorious murder case. A man found hacked to death with a tomahawk this morning is the father of Mark Van Crevel, convicted last month of the murders of former Wollongong Mayor Frank Arkell and shopkeeper David O'Hearn. Van Krebel's family said it was a direct result of his father's sexual abuse. Ah, that's Bob. He drove him to do what he did. He's the one that should be in jail. How do you feel about your father's death now? Oh, I don't know. Um... Well, I mean, not sad as yet, but it, it'll happen. It was clear Belinda Van Krebel had no regrets about her father's murder. The fact that she was in the next room when Schreiber was killing him and did nothing to stop it heightened police suspicion of her involvement. The big question was, why didn't she use the mobile phone that was located near her bed to ring the police? Why didn't she go to the neighbour's house to use their phone to ring police? Another question is, why did she travel all the way to Warilla, which is about 15 minutes away, to make the report when she could have driven to the Albion Park Police Station, which is only about five minutes around the corner? One possible scenario was that Belinda was distraught at what she had heard earlier, but it raised a number of questions, such as, is there a connection between Belinda and the person that killed Jack Van Krebel? I've been told that for the past four or so weeks that you've actually been in a relationship with Belinda Van Krebel. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you care to tell me about that? It's irrelevant. Is it correct? Uh, sort of, yeah. At Mark Valera's trial, I noticed that Keith and Belinda had spent a considerable amount of time with each other, to the point where you could almost say that they had a relationship happening. Belinda said she was with Keith Schreiber on the day prior to the murder, that they were in company for several hours together. When we were talking, um, I had her photos in my car, and I was showing him some photos of me and Mark together when we were little, because we are always together. The fact that that conversation had occurred the day prior to the murder of Jack was of particular significance to police. Did you tell Keith about what happened to, to Tia? Oh, yeah. What did he say? Oh, he got pretty angry. He had been told certain things by Belinda insofar as what Jack had done to Belinda, her child, and, and to Mark. Jack molested Mark. And Tia has been, um, the, his granddaughter has been saying, coming out with, with a few weird things. Did she ask uh, you to do it? Uh, yeah, I know, I know she wanted, she wanted him to um, She wanted him done? Mm. With Keith Schreiber under arrest and charged with Jack's murder, detectives now concentrated on Belinda's involvement in her father's death. Jack believed that there was a $2,000 contract out on his life, which he um, had heard of a couple of days prior to his murder. He had been advised by his wife that uh, Belinda had put out a contract on him and that uh, that contract was with Keith Schreiber. Jack was advised to contact police, but he didn't. And three days later, he was dead. Electron, any recorded interview between Detective Senior Constable Jamie Williams and Belinda Van Crevel. It was now eight months since her father had been murdered. Did um, your mum, Elizabeth Carroll, mention to you any allegations of your involvement in your dad's death? Oh, apparently I told her that I was going to get Keith to kill Dad, that I told her that I was going to pay him to do it. Um, 
just that's about it really. So she said to you that you told her that you were going to get Keith to kill your father. Yeah. <coughs> Is she that wasn't... true? No. You didn't say that no. to her? No. Have you ever paid Keith any money? No. For what? Since your I... father's death, have you ever given him any money? Um, no, I haven't. After conducting several interviews with Belinda, we established sufficient evidence to conduct and execute a search warrant on her premises. From that search warrant, we located several money orders that we could directly associate to deposits that were made into Keith's account whilst in jail. From the Shahada Square Post Office on the 9th of April 2001, in the amount of $200, and there was more damning evidence. Just located a letter on the one that's got Keith. Mm hmm. Is that right? Okay, well, that's, um, yeah, obviously. In the letter, Keith's talking about, and I should have bought a radio with that money, but all I got was a kettle for $30 and the rest on tobacco and drinks and food. This is the person that killed your father, and you're sending him money. Do you think that's, that was a bit strange? No. No, not really, no. Okay. I was still friends with him, I talked to him, so... And what was your relationship with Keith Shriver at the time your dad was murdered? It was um, a normal sort of relationship, uh, just friends, you know. So were you like going out with each other? Um, no. And you'd never gone out with Keith, right? Mm -hmm. No, I never even thought about it. <laughs> you ever had any relationships with him, sexual-wise or any nature like that? Oh, I won't answer that. I don't think that's got anything to do with this. It's actually got a lot to do with it because it's investigating the murder of your father. Yeah, he's, but what's sex got to do with he's someone being murdered? We're just trying to, we're just trying to work out what relationship you had with the person who murdered your father. But, and like, but, a, would it make a difference, would it? Well, it may make a difference to our investigation. Oh, uh, why is that? Well, that's all we have to work out. Oh, right, OK then. Yeah, right, what was the next question? Well, into this letter addressed to Keith, do you agree that that's your handwriting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You discuss here about your, um, your closeness to Keith. It says, uh, I miss you heaps, you see, Keith. The thing I love the most is that no one really knows how much we trust and care about each other. I mean, I've been so close to you for how many years and no one could make up that that they've done more for me than what you have. I'll always look up to you and no one will ever come as anywhere near as close to me as you are. So you were in a physical relationship? I have been, yeah. You told us before that yeah, you never had or you had been? No, I said I didn't want to tell you. So now you're prepared to talk about it? Yeah. What's the situation with the... Your relationship I had sex with, with him. I believe that she used her relationship with Keith to manipulate him to a point to commit the murder. The letters that we located and the money orders that we also seized were crucial pieces of evidence in relation to identifying that Belinda had had a direct involvement in the murder of Jack. A young woman has faced court in Wollongong charged with killing her father. Belinda Van Krebel grinned broadly when the judge handed down his ruling. Belinda Van Krebel was sentenced to six years for soliciting to have her father murdered. She was due for parole in May of 2005, but her plea for an early release was rejected. As for the man she solicited, Keith Schreiber will be in jail until at least 2012. I'll just get you to turn around, Mark, and just face Her brother, the Mark Valera, Jack's son and Keith's best friend is spending the rest of his life in jail for the murders of David O'Hearn and Frank Arkell. I believe Jack was the salt of the earth father. He, he was trying his best and to end up with such a tragedy on his hands and then eventually his own murder, I suppose, it was, was unbelievable. It, it gets easier as time goes by, but you kind of think at the time and even now, it's sort of unreal, like it didn't really happen to our family. Those sort of things don't happen to ordinary people. We were just an ordinary family. And... 
We didn't think it would ever happen to us. He didn't deserve to die.